course, the U.S. and Canada came with a ridiculous commitment, 3 to 4% by 2020 based on 1990 levels. Of course, the difference between the United States and Canada, uh, which, which was just rather embarrassing, I think, on the global stage, especially for those of you that are big time nationalists, you know, is that Canada actually signed the first Kyoto Agreement. And as Dave mentioned, it's now 34% um, above you know where we're supposed to be in terms of the first internationally legally binding treaty we signed and um, you know Canada definitely uh, in partnership with its big bully brother the United States government was in Copenhagen doing everything that they could to systematically kill um, the second track of negotiations the high-level negotiations around the Kyoto Protocol uh, post Kyoto uh, agreement um, and why were they doing this you know, why was Canada and the United States there, um, you know, doing everything in their power to suppress any kind of reference to human rights based uh, language in the document? You know, why were they there uh, suppressing any reference to the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples? You know, these are really good questions to ask yourself. And the reason why is because, of course, our economic structure, our economy here in Canada is predominantly based on extractive industries sending the resources that are being extracted from the lands here in Canada, where do they go? Well, they go to our biggest trading partner, which is, of course, the United States of America. And, you know, what are these resources? Well, it's oil, and minerals, timber, you know, these sorts of things. And where are these resources coming from? Well, if you take a map of all 636 reservations, okay, Indian communities across this country, all the Métis settlements, and, of course, all the Inuit communities in the Arctic, you will see that every major oil and gas development, transmission line, hydroelectric mega dam, uh, you know, massive open pit mine, uh, the tar sands development, pipelines coming out of the tar sands, refineries are all within you know, 20 or 40 kilometers of an indigenous community. And so, why is Canada one of three countries on the planet yet to ratify the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples? Because if they did, things like the environmental racism that is playing out, uh, being you know, pushed by Canada's environmental, climate, and energy, basically our economic policy, um, would not be possible. You know, the tar sands would not be possible if Canada ratified the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which is of course the bare minimum, okay? It is in no way representative of all of indigenous people's needs in terms of our fundamental right to exist, you know, uh, our human rights. It is the bare minimum standard, okay, that came and was ratified by the UN um, after 25 years of tireless work by many of our indigenous leaders. Climate negotiations in Copenhagen resulted in a no agreement called the Copenhagen Accord, as you've heard. And this accord has no real requirements for any countries to have reduction targets. The failure to achieve a real deal lies on the shoulders of rich countries whose pollution has caused the climate crisis, especially the US, Canada, European Union, Denmark, and other industrialized countries. Now, rich countries refused to budge from the grossly inadequate emissions reduction targets proposals that they brought to Copenhagen. And so our message, you know, one of the messages that our delegation took is that a growing body of Western scientific evidence suggests what we have been saying forever. For a long time, life as we know it, bottom line, is in danger. We've got to do something about it. And, you know, the, the other three main points that we went into Copenhagen pushing was to recognize and respect the rights of indigenous peoples um, and local communities, in particular their rights to lands, territories, and all resources in accordance with the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and other relevant international human rights instruments and obligations. The second uh, primary thing that we were there to push for uh, in a very forceful way um, was to ensure the full and effective participation of indigenous peoples and local communities in accordance with the right to free prior and informed dis consent, which in most simplistic terms is the right to say no. Um, and three, to recognize the fundamental role and contribution of indigenous peoples, traditional knowledge, innovations, and practices. I think 60,000 years of ecological you know, know-how is, uh, is pretty good, uh, uh, it's a pretty good resume, you know, we know what we're talking about. And so, you know, the Copenhagen Accord is a high-stakes deal maker, was really a Copenhagen steal. Uh, maintaining indigenous people's participation is mentioned inside the Bella Center, 
uh, was very important during the waning hours of the conference to ensure the rights of indigenous peoples would be recognized in the accord. This, however, did not happen. Neither human rights language nor the rights of indigenous peoples were recognized in the ridiculous agreement that came out of Copenhagen. And this will lead to further human rights violations. Mark my words, climate destruction, loss of land, and the disruption of livelihood and well-being of not just indigenous communities uh, from the Arctic and the global south, but coastal peoples and other you know, populations that are urban-based, that are susceptible, you know, low-income people that are, that are not insulated from the ravages of our rapidly destabilizing climate. And the final Copenhagen Accord could enshrine scientifically unsound and dangerously low emissions reductions targets that could represent a death sentence for these very communities that I'm talking about, that IEN supports, and you know, really that we're made of. Representatives of Athabasca Chippewan First Nation, of Fort Smith Landing First Nation, talking about the grave impacts of the world's most destructive development, the tar sands uh, on their way of life, the cultural genocide, uh, legally sanctioned by the government of Canada that's taking place with this development. These types of global market-based solutions like forest offsets, like the World Bank uh, REDS initiative, you know, enable these types of developments to actually expand. Because Canada, through its investments in the World Bank, can say, hey, we planted two million trees in Indonesia, so let's expand the tar sands. The reality of energy policy in both Canada and the United States is that the majority of uh, mega developments are grossly uh, disproportionately impacting indigenous peoples uh, who of course you know whether it's the tar sands or mega coal extraction in Montana, Wyoming or in Big Mountain in the Navajo Nation, Black Mesa, um, you know or just dozens of refineries that are being retrofitted, new proposed refineries, coal-fired power plants. A lot of these facilities, uh, as I mentioned, are being built on the backs of indigenous peoples and our communities are being sacrificed at the altar of irresponsible economic policy. You know, we went to Copenhagen to demand action, not false hopes and empty promises, um, just like everybody else here on this panel. Um, the delays and bullying tactics of Canada and the United States amounted to continued uh, carbon colonialism, and as indigenous peoples, we must raise the bar. We must demand the most stringent emissions reduction targets, and uh, you know, and, and we're going to continue to uh, enforce that we are the true guardians of Mother Earth, and you know, and, and we want to you know carry this responsibility and solidarity with you know our our, our good allies and friends um, that we share these lands uh, and resources with.